There are three economic theories that we need to go ahead and take a look at. The classical theory, the Keynesian theory, and the monetarist theory. And there's really no right or wrong sort of theory for you guys to follow. It's basically how you were raised and what you sort of believe in. So we'll go ahead and lay out the foundations of each of the theories in this particular section. So the easiest way to divide up these particular theories is to go ahead and take a look at some type of time differentiation. If there is some type of short run, if you believe a short run, there are going to be some type of lag before we can actually reach our long run equilibrium. Or if we can feel some type of short run impacts of prices, wages, or any of the macroeconomic variables within the economy, then you want to go ahead and follow the Keynesian or the monetary sort of trains of thought. However, if you don't believe in the short run at all, you only believe that there is a long run and that the economy adjusts instantaneously to the long run, that's where you're going to believe the classical theory. And remember, the classical theory is what most people believed before the Great Depression. And there's actually still a group of people today that still follow the classical sort of trains of thought. So with the classical economists, they focus in on long run adjustments in, act in economic activity. They assume that all the major macroeconomic variables that we take a look at, wages, prices, interest rates, they're all considered to be flexible, meaning that they adjust instantaneously or right away to the long run equilibrium. As a result, labor, product, and capital markets are expected to adjust to keep the economy at full employment. So essentially, any type of shock that we have within the economy, whether it be positive or negative, all of these macroeconomic variables are going to adjust instantaneously just like that. And from this, we're going to always be at our long-run equilibrium at full employment. Uh, not too realistic in this sort of case. But there is, it provides us with a very, very good foundation for a lot of economic theories down the line. And one of the major sort of contributions that people that follow the classical theory believe is the quantity theory of money, also known as the equation of exchange. So let's go ahead and jot this down. We have the equation of exchange. Equation of exchange. And with the equation of exchange, it's basically going to go ahead and tell us a few different things about what, they, about what they believe about the economy. We have four variables. We have M. We multiply this by V. It's equal to P times Q. So four variables that make up the equation of exchange or the quantity theory of money. M is something that we already know. It's the money supply. So money supply. And this is typically denoted as M1 as well. V is going to be our new variable. It's considered to be the velocity of money. Velocity of money. And velocity of money just tells us exactly how many times do we use that same dollar bill, a same dollar bill that you have in your wallet or purses for transactions in a given year. So we can actually go ahead and track that $1 bill that you have in your wallet, see exactly how many times you're going to use that same $1 bill for purchases of goods and services throughout a particular year. And the velocity of money, it doesn't change all too often. I think the velocity of money right now is roughly about three to four. So we use that same dollar bill, the same $20 bill that you have for about three to four transactions in a given year. P is going to be the price level. Price level. So that could be used with the GDP deflator or with the CPI. We already know about that. And then finally here we have Q and Q is going to be real GDP real GDP or the economy's real output level. Economy's real output level. So here, what we have on the left-hand side, M times V has to equal the right-hand side, P times Q. When we take P times Q together, that is just going to be known as our nominal GDP. So nominal GDP. So P times Q is nominal GDP, but Q just by itself is real GDP. We know the differences between these two right here. So what exactly do classical economists believe with this equation of exchange? Well, we need to introduce a few assumptions in order to see the major conclusion that they're going to bring out of this. So a few assumptions that we have right here. So assumptions. So assumption number one is that velocity is considered to be fixed. Velocity is fixed. So velocity is fixed because our amount of transactions that we conduct on an everyday basis, on an every year basis, doesn't change all too much. So the same dollar bill that you use isn't going to be used for more than, uh, it's not going to be. So essentially from this, velocity is going to be fixed. 
and we know that, hey, that same dollar bill that you have in your purse or wallet, it's probably going to be used for the same amount of transactions on a year-to-year -year basis. So here, that is the first assumption that they're going to go ahead and build up. Second assumption that they say is that, hey, Q is fixed at full employment. So our amount of real GDP is fixed, is fixed at full employment, full employment. Meant. Meaning that, hey, we know exactly what our potential or full employment GDP is going to be, and this is exactly where we should be converging to in the long run. So with these two assumptions in mind, we can actually change up our equation of, our equation of exchange just a little bit. So anytime in economics and even mathematics we consider a variable to be fixed or constant, we can put a little bit of, of a bar over it. So here, M is something that can change. When we multiply it by V, velocity, we put a bar over it to denote that it's fixed or it is constant. And then we can do the same thing with real GDP. So M times V bar equals P times Q bar. And this bar over the variable just denotes that they are going to be fixed. So money supply and the price level, these are the only things that can change based on what we have, with, based on the assumptions that we have right here. So just taking a close look at this equation, what can you sort of conclude that classical economists are going to believe about monetary policy and also by extension fiscal policy? If we change M in order for this equation to equate or to be exactly equal to one another, what has to happen to P? If we increase P, if we increase M, P also has to increase because V and Q are not changing. If we decrease M, P also has to go down in order for this equation to work. And that leads us to the major conclusion that we have for the classical economist. It tells us that any change, any change in M will in the money supply will directly, will directly lead to a change in P. Will directly lead to a change in P. As we have right here, uh, any change in the money supply will directly lead to a change in the price levels. So essentially here, if we double the money supply, we notice that, hey, the price level is going to double as well. We have a lot of inflation. And this is pretty much one of the reasons why classical economists do not like monetary policy or the central bank or the Federal Reserve all too much because they believe that any changes in, in the money supply is just going to lead to inflation. And we can work with a simple example with this just to show you exactly what happens with, uh, with these numbers right here. So suppose that I tell you initially we have a money supply equal to, say, $2 trillion. We have a price le level equal to 1.5. We have Q bar stuck at 8. And we also have V bar stuck at 6. So what happens if we double the money supply? So suppose that the Federal Reserve decides that, hey, the best thing to do for the economy right here is to go ahead and double the money supply. Suppose the money supply, money supply doubles. And we want to go ahead and see what is expected to happen. What is expected to happen? So what is expected to happen if we are following the classical train of thought? And in order to solve this out, you just go ahead and do what the problem tells you to do. So we know that Q is always going to be fixed. So we stick that at 8. We know V is going to be fixed. We stick that at 6. P is going to change. And M is going to double. So if M doubles, it goes 2 times 2. So here it equals 2 to 4. And we notice that when we initially start us off, the equation of exchange does equate. M times V, so 2 times 6 is equal to 12, and P times Q, 8 times 1.5 equals to 12 as well. So here, when we have M times V, it's going to be 4 times 6, which equals to 24. So in order for the right-hand side to equal to 24, what times 8 is going to equal to 24? Well, if the money supply doubles, we also notice that it's the same thing is going to happen to the price level as well. So the price level is expected to double as well. So it goes from 1.5 to 3 in this instance. So whatever happens to the money supply, we're going to see the same exact shock on the price level as well. And this is essentially the main conclusion that the classical economists bring about with this equation of exchange. There's not going to be really any real impacts on the economy at all. And we can go ahead and see what this looks like graphically using our AD and LRAS analysis. So here we've already laid out the equation right here, all the variables, and we know the few assumptions that we have right here. So the main conclusion, any result 
As a result, any change in the money supply will translate directly to a change in prices. Graphically, this is what we have right here. We have aggregate demand and we have LRAS. We don't have an SRAS curve at all because remember, there is no short run in the classical train of thought or in the classical model. They believe everything is going to adjust instantaneously to the long run equilibrium. So if we pursue some type of expansionary monetary policy that's gonna shift our aggregate demand curve outward away from the origin, but what happens to our long run equilibrium? All that's going to leave us is with higher prices with the same amount of GDP. So we go from point E to point B right here. And here we go from P0 to P1. All we have is inflation, very, very high prices with the same amount of full employment GDP. And this is pretty much the main reason why classical economists do not like monetary policy at all. In fact, they don't like any government intervention at all. So we can actually apply this with fiscal policy as well. Because with fiscal policy, aggregate demand is also going to shift either to the right or to the left, depending on for pursuing expansionary or contractionary fiscal policy. But with expansionary fiscal policy, we shift the AD over to the right. And once again, that's just going to leave us with higher prices in the long run. So if you believe in the classical train of thought with classical economists, you basically believe that we should not have any government intervention at all, either through monetary policy or with fiscal policy, because you believe that the economy will be self-correcting all the time. We will always be converging to our long-run equilibrium instantly instantaneously, there are no short run impacts at all. While this may not be a little bit real, uh, realistic in this sort of case, the equation of exchange can be worked just a little bit. We can sort of change the assumptions just a little bit, and that can actually lead to a few different implications for our other trains of thoughts. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this sort of impacts. So let's go ahead and change a few of the assumptions up just a little bit and no longer assume that, hey, Velocity and real GDP are going to be fixed. Some of our other variables can be fixed as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at this particular example. So suppose the economy is at full employment. Suppose economy is at full employment, full employment. And in this instance, in this particular example, velocity decreases and velocity decreases, decreases. So for some reason, velocity is going to decrease. We typically see de velocity in application decreasing anytime there is some type of recession or bad economic downturn. If the Federal Reserve, if the Fed wants stable prices, if the Fed wants stable prices, what should it do? What should it do? So just by changing a few of the assumptions based on the equation of exchange, it can actually lead to a few policy implications for the other sort of economic trains of thoughts that we're going to get into. So with this setup that we have right here, we still have M times V equals P times Q. But based on the information that's being provided to you, which variables are considered to be fixed now? So economy is still at full employment. So economy is at full employment, meaning that, hey, real GDP is still going to be fixed. Velocity is going to decrease, so we know that this is going to go down. We can put that there. And what is something else that we know? We, want, we know that the Federal Reserve wants stable prices. So stable prices just means that, hey, we don't want the price level to change at all. We want it to stay constant. So here in this instance, the price level is going to be fixed. So if the right-hand side does not change at all, but velocity goes down, in order to combat this impact right here to keep prices stable, what should the Federal Reserve do? What should they do with the money supply? The Federal Reserve should go ahead and increase the money supply. So Fed should increase the money supply. Money supply. So here, when they increase the money supply, in the same sort of in the opposite ratio of the velocity decreasing that's exactly how they can go ahead and keep the right hand side exactly the same and once again you can go ahead and choose a few arbitrary numbers to go ahead and test this out so suppose that i tell you that maybe m is 2.5 just to start us off maybe velocity is 4 and p and q is 1 and 10 respectively so when velocity decreases we still want the same exact right hand side Remember, P and Q are exactly the same, so we don't change those at all. And suppose that velocity goes down by half, so it goes down to two in this instance. What has to happen to the money supply in order for it to equal 
to the right hand side right here. So right hand side, one times 10 is equal to 10. So what has to happen to the money supply? It has to double in order for this equation to equate. So here, five times two will give us 10. So same as 2.5 times four equals to 10. So here we know exactly what the Federal Reserve should do in order to keep prices stable. They have to increase the money supply in this instance. So once again, we're just adjusting a few of the assumptions with the equation of exchange just a little bit just so we can get a few policy implications for monetary policy for the other economic trains of thought so with all of this in mind we have a basic idea of the classical theory the equation of exchange and what classical economists believe in remember there is no short run there is only the long run and we will always adjust to the long run equilibrium instantaneously Fiscal policy and monetary policy are very ineffective. We don't need any government intervention at all if you believe the classical train of thought. We'll go ahead and take a look at the next trains of thoughts in the next video.